Hey guys, it is Marcus and Terry here with you today from the old Talk Sober. Hope you guys are doing well. I'm going to see if I can find my little thing where I see you guys. There we go. Cool. Uh, today what we're doing is we're talking about letter number three. And if you remember correctly, we're going through the sobriety letters that I had written. Um, I've been writing them over the last year, year and a half. And uh, what they do is they're designed to help you get sober. So the idea is, hey, you know what, if you read one of these every day for 31 days, my goal is to change your brain, change your mind about alcohol. Don't think I could physically change your brain. I'm not a doctor. Um, but, um, you know, what it's going to do is it's going to help you learn what it takes to get sober. It's going to help you see inside the mind of an alcoholic and understand what's going on. Because I think for me and Terry as well, one of the hardest things was understanding what's going on because you look around and you're like, well, there's Tim over there and, you know, he drinks and he's fine and he doesn't have these thoughts and he's not crazy. Um, and, it, you know, it kind of baffled us where it was like, well, Tim could just set beer down half full and walk out of the bar. Right. Like, I, I couldn't do that. I was like, OK, I got to finish it. One, I paid nine bucks for the beer at a, at a bar and, you know, so I got to drink it. And two, because I'm an alcoholic, I have to finish it. And I would probably go back and finish Tim's as well. Of um, course. You know, so, <laughs> um, so we got to look at that and we got to look at this. And, and, you know, it's interesting because when I moved here to Florida, we have these things called alligators. And for me, I thought that they were going to be walking around the road and hanging out in our backyard. But I've been here almost uh, two years and I haven't seen one yet. So uh, I, I've seen them in the pond sometimes, but they're not roaming around. And the reason I bring this up is because alligators have a very primitive brain, right? They have a brain that says food. So in Florida, they tell us not to feed the alligators because what happens is the alligator starts to look at it and they're like, hey, that Marcus guy equals food. When I go to Marcus and see Marcus, I think food. And the alligator starts to think humans equal food. Right? right. And so that kind of gets in their brain and, and in recovery and alcoholism, you're going to learn a lot about the brain, the reptile brain, the impulse brain versus the evolved. Hey, let's stop back and think about this for a minute. And we're right. going to go over that today. And what I'm going to do, I think our letter here is I don't know how long this one is, but I'll go ahead and read it. And then, Terry, if you want to chime in at any time uh, to give me a break or to, um, you know, comment on something, uh, feel free. And then we'll discuss the letter after. Now, if you're listening, if you're listening online, um, there's a little chat box that you can get through uh, through YouTube and you can actually ask questions. So if you have questions um, about recovery, about what we've gone through, um, about what's going on with us, about what it was like in the beginning, about how to stay sober. Uh, feel free to ask them, but remember, we are not trained doctors. We're not addiction recovery specialists. We're just two guys who happen to be in rehab at the same time, had very similar outlooks on things, and want to kind of help people understand what's going on with recovery, with alcohol, and with your life. So feel free to put those questions in there. So let's start off with letter number three, entitled Retraining the Reptile Brain. Hi again. I hope you're doing better. It's been kind of rough for me this morning as I woke up not feeling that great and my body temperature was super hot. It doesn't help that I spent half the morning outside in the humid hot air sucking on cigars, I'm sure. I think I got heat exhaustion or something. It was like 80 with 70% humidity and I was out there for like three hours straight. That's one of the things I had to learn to deal with in my sobriety. Some days you just don't feel good and that's okay. We learn from it and we move on. As I learned when I was in rehab, some days you just feel like shit. Yep. My old reptile brain go-to strategy for not feeling well used to be to drink. I would drink when I had a headache, a cold, the flu, or was just tired. So or let's just, start. Or just happy or sad. <laughs> yeah, or anything. It's just because I woke up. Yep. Um, so yeah, let's start off today by going over the ass fall off pact again. Today, you're not going to drink again, even if your ass falls off. Remember. Tomorrow you can go out and get all fucked up if you still want to. But today we're going to stay sober. And if you read these letters first thing in the morning, several times a day if needed, things will start to change for you, I believe. With that said, today's letter is all about retraining your reptile brain. What is a reptile brain, you ask? Well, it's the primitive part of your brain, the autopilot part that controls your impulse, your obsessions, your day-to-day -day rituals, and the flight or fight response in your, in your mind. So 
When something scares you, it's the thing that makes you jump. Needless to say, this part of our brain does not use words to speak to us, but rather just sends chemically driven emotion waves through our body and mind. And I think that's important to remember that the words are not there. Because a lot of people try to combat alcoholism with words and talking themselves out of it, which does help. But sometimes when you're dealing with anxiety and you're dealing with um, emotions that your reptile brain gives you, remember the reptile brain did not have the English language. So we got to remember that. This thing's going to come at you. It's going to come at you strong, and you're not going to know what to do with it. But if you listen to this stuff, I think it'll help you. So this is the part of my brain that ordered drinks for me at lunch when I wasn't paying attention. It will nag the hell out of you till it gets what it wants. And it wants to drink. You have trained it to want to drink over and over again. That's how your reptile brain works. Sometimes you won't even see it coming. And it's always the one that you don't see coming that gets you. So be on guard. Just knowing it's there isn't going to help you. You need to recognize it and take a minute to evaluate what's going on. Sometimes it's just a weird feeling. Other times, uh, other times it's warning you of something. The reptile brain learns by experience. Touch the hot stove, ow, bam. Memory is burned into your subconscious, ouch, don't touch hot stoves. Sometimes you, can't even f- you, sometimes you can even feel the burn in your mind just by thinking about it. And the crazy thing about this one is that it doesn't use words. So it's not like you think, oh, gee, a stove, I better not touch that. No, it's boom, instant feeling in the body. You can't even see, you can even see someone's demeanor change before they even notice what's going on. The mind is funny like that. You could be driving along, having a perfect day, and all of a sudden, severe sadness. Out of nowhere, for no reason, you're just down in the dumps. But what you didn't see was there was three things that you passed on your drive that reminded you unconsciously of someone you miss. Could be someone walking a puppy, a billboard, or three notes from a song that reminded you of them. You weren't even thinking about it. You didn't even consciously see the triggers or hear the song, and like that, boom, your mind triggers sadness. The same thing with alcohol, only instead of one song or someone walking a puppy, you have linked this alcohol equals a good feeling to damn near everything in your house, outside your house, and pretty much everywhere you go. Hell, at this point, it's probably linked to your anxiety, which shows up worse when you're trying not to drink. Sucks, doesn't it? So, you feel like crap one day, your reptile brain knows the remedy. Drink it away. And the more you reinforce something in your reptile brain, the harder it gets to change. If you keep touching the hot stove over and over, pretty soon the reptile brain will make you you a stove-aphobic or something like that. That's how these things develop. Now, when we moved to Florida a couple summers ago, we quickly learned that it's illegal to feed the alligators. The reason is simple. Once an alligator, a.k.a. giant lizard, brain is fed by a human, its mind now equates humans with food. And the feelings of hunger are now associated with humans as a way to feel full. Because the alligator does not think in language, he can't sit back and cross his legs and think about his actions before he performs them. Because he's on autopilot. So he just acts based on feelings without thought. Like a baby who cannot yet articulate his feelings, wants, and desires. He just feels hungry or tired or needy and cries and cries and cries until he gets what he wants. Your lizard brain is going to cry and cry and cry until you give it what it wants. Only on top of this reptile brain thing, you also have chemical dependency, which means your body now thinks it needs alcohol to survive. When I was drinking, I got, the point, got to the point where I pretty much was living on a few bites of food each day and several gallons of alcoholic beverages, beer, wine in the morning, in the afternoons, and hard stuff at night. Unless we, all we had was hard stuff or I really needed to escape, then I would just skip the beer and wine and go straight for the real deal. Then, after I woke up at whatever time it was, sometimes 2 p.m. in the afternoon, sometimes 4 a.m. in the morning, sometimes 12 a.m., it was unpredictable, untri- really, and because of all the drinking, my lousy sleep schedule, I always felt like shit. And the reptile brain knows how to fix this. Hey, it's got it handled. You just grab another drink or 20, which led to more op- odd sleep times, which led to more feeling like crap, which led to more drinking. I was in the, dre- the death grip of an alcoholic hysteria. Knowing I had to quit was not enough. Thinking I was going to die was not enough. At this point, I actually welcomed the idea. After all, a piece of shit like me should die and give my family the life insurance and the blessing of not having me around. But it was really me. But was it really me 
who had become this terrible thing, I couldn't stand to look in the mirror. Or was I on autopilot? Was this reptile brain taking over my thoughts, feelings, emotions, and causing me to repeat this insane behavior over and over and over again? Sure, there are some parts of me that are probably quite asshole but is this who I am? Remember the example I talked about yesterday about those people who went through crazy things and had their personalities almost completely wiped out so much that people couldn't recognize them? Here's a quote by Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is I, our power to choose our response. Our response lies, our, in our response lies our growth and our freedom. That quote was written by a Holocaust survivor, and I have to think that he knows a thing or two about how to survive a bad situation. You see, what's happening here is we are not allowing time between the lizard brain and the thinking brain, conscious mind. We are acting on impulse, reacting rather than responding. We must now learn how to interrupt that process. That is what's going on with you. That's what went on with me. Your reptile brain has put you in a tailspin and your body has followed by feeling like it now needs alcohol to survive. Now, before we go any further, you should know that alcohol addiction is dangerous and detoxing cold turkey or even at all can be fatal. I would highly advise that you seek medical attention and look for warning signs. Get on the phone with a doctor. Be upfront about your amounts and get some help with that. Get this book. These letters will not replace doctor advice or a supervised detox. Get it now and don't fuck around with this stuff. Terry can attest to that. Yeah. Uh, with that <laughs> said, you probably know by now that you're an alcoholic. You are in a alcoholic hysteria tailspin. And it's starting to make more sense why the big bad you can't beat this tiny little bottle. If I strapped you to a merry-go-round for 12 hours straight and spun it as fast as I could, you wouldn't call yourself a weakling for feeling dizzy, would you? So here you are, and you're on this merry-go-round. And when it's going, it kind of feels fun. And when it stops, you feel like crap. So you keep going and going and going, and now it's too late, and you can't get off anymore. Because your reptile brain is going to tell you, keep going, keep going, keep going. This is going to fix it. And sometimes you'll be sitting there happy, having the ride of your life for a few hours a day. And that reptile brain, for no apparent reason, causes an urge and you almost have no choice but to hop back on the ride. Or having been off the ride for a few hours. Uh, this is what you're dealing with here. It's not some guy at a bar who just likes to drink. If you're resonating with these letters and what I'm saying, you're probably a full-blown alcoholic. Yeah. Only, till now, you haven't really been able to see how this works. Not because you're not so smart. No way. My IQ was about, five, er, it was about 158 last I checked. I took the test online, so it's probably really like 14. But needless to say, I wasn't some dumbass off the street who didn't research this stuff. I looked into it deep and tried to figure out, quote-unquote, what is wrong with me. Here's a few things that I figured out. One, nothing is really wrong with me. I'm just human making my way through life. All the things that I do are conditioned responses that are formed by the situations that I found myself in. Can't get mad when I get dizzy on the merry-go-round. Number two, you can stop the world with one breath. Yeah. Allow yourself to stop when you get frustrated, anxious, or feel angry. Now I, don't, now I know these things are just feelings, and feelings won't kill me. Drinking might kill me, but these feelings will just be okay. Give yourself a 15-minute break, and just think about it. Everything can wait 15 minutes. Number three, racing thoughts and emotions are not to be taken seriously, and you do not need to be, and do not need to be drowned in alcohol. That just makes them worse in the long run. This is what got you into this mess, and I'm going to teach you how to get out of it. So today we learned how the reptile works and what it desires. Remember, you don't have to feed it. Feeding it only makes it stronger and makes it crave more. You are going to learn a new way of life, and right now it seems far out of reach. And some of the stuff might seem kind of crazy, but we're going get to get through this together. Remember, today, don't drink even if your ass falls off. Muscle through the nasty feelings without alcohol. Your reptile wants you to think that it's worse than it is so that you can cave in and feed her. But remember, don't feed the fucking alligators. Pause the world with a 15-minute break and start living your life by not reacting, but rather responding. Talk to you tomorrow. We're going to go over false confidence 
based on feelings. Your friend, Marcus. All right. Right on, Marcus. Cool. That's Any good. thoughts on that? I'm going to get a water here. That's a good letter. Hey, Naomi, congratulations on 67 days sober. That's awesome. That and uh, awesome. that's that's funny because you you said you said later uh, uh, detoxes hell. Um, you ended up in the uh, in the the ICU. That's exactly what I ended up doing. And yeah, detox. Well, for me, detox. Well, at least that time when I got sober was absolutely pain free because I was in an induced coma the entire time. So uh, it took me a little while to get back, but. Um, you're talking about how you're sleep, you sleeping all night. That's yeah. It took me about a month, month and a half before I started to sleep all night. Before you know, I was like, "Wow, sleep is great." So that's a really great thing. Uh, Marcus really hits the nail on the head with this with this uh, letter as far as um, it just drinking just becomes a habit, and that's what it did for me. I just it was like. Every day I'd be, I'd take that walk down to the liquor store, especially when I uh, had lost my license. But uh, yeah, take that walk, that 12 minute walk, and I'd be just telling myself, okay, this is the last one. And then the next day, just automatic pilot, I'd be on my way down there to get another one. That was just a daily activity. And anytime any issues came up, and he says earlier, you know, no matter what the, the stressful or bad situation that would come up, um, He'd have a drink, and that was the case with me. But and it was also with the whether I was happy or sad. You know, alcohol just made me feel good, and alcohol made me feel good all the way to the end. The I finally had to quit just because it was physically killing me. But I still liked the way alcohol made me feel. That's the craziest thing, and that's why it just became a habit. Yeah. Alcohol made me happy, and no matter what I did I had to have another one no matter how much I told myself I've got to quit because it's killing me and I have to have another one that's why I did end up having to go to the hospital and do what I had to do to get sober and yeah. that's what I still do today is do what I have to do to stay sober yeah. so yeah good good letter Marcus thanks yeah Naomi congrats that's awesome I remember 67 days is that's a big deal that's that's like getting through the hump, you know, um, understanding yourself, starting to sleep normal and realize, hey, you know what? What the heck was I doing? And remember that, like, remember your worst day. And that's what I do. Like, I, like I think of it myself. And when I think about having it, because sometimes, you know, it's a hot summer day and I make my spicy shrimp and I'm like, you know, a cold one would sound good right now. And I tell myself, you know, yeah, go ahead. Have another glass of insanity. You know, drink it down. Have the glass. Um, remember what it was like to feel drunk all the time. Remember what it was like to not be in charge of your thoughts and your mind. Remember what it was like to just be controlled by something. You know, and, and it's a lot like um, like road rage, right? Uh, people who have road rage, they don't think. They just react. It's like you hit my car, and it's like, well, right. it's a freaking piece of metal. There's probably a billion cars in the world. You can go get another one. They'll make it the same mm -hmm. way. But you're out of, you're bent out of shape. You're getting out of your car. You're ready to get in a fist fight, like a normal person, ready to get in a fist fight over what, over what, you know? And us going insane and going crazy and having all this stuff over what, a drink, alcohol, like seriously. Right. Um, and you know, it's interesting because a drink might make you feel like if I had one, I'd probably feel good. If I had as many as I used to, I'd probably be in the hospital. Um, and there's lots of things that you can do that would make you feel good. But the fact of the matter is, is you can start feeling good without them, right? I feel great almost every day. Sometimes I wake up a little too late and when I wake up late, I don't feel good. Um, but now I know that 30 minutes later, I'm going to be okay. And one of the interesting things that I learned as well is a lot of the things that you seek are going to happen automatically anyway. About two years ago, I stopped drinking caffeinated coffee in the morning. And I thought, what's, you know, I'm not going to drink caffeine, so I'm going to wake up, I'm going to be miserable, I'm going to be tired all day. Right? And what I found out is that it's the ritual of waking up that wakes you up. Right? It's not the coffee. It's the ritual. It's the 30 minutes. You have the 30 minutes. You sit there. I drink my decaf or water or whatever it is that day. And 
in 30 minutes, I feel the same way I would have if I had a cup of coffee. Same thing happens with alcohol, right? You get these feelings, you get these thoughts, and you're like, I need to drown them in alcohol. But if you wait 30 minutes, chances are they're probably going to subside anyway, right? right? So it really, we have the illusion that it's helping us, if that makes sense. It does. <laughs> when, uh, you know, that 30 minutes or, or, it, or 15 or 30 minutes of pausing, that's, that's another important factor. But for me, just sitting there for 15 minutes thinking that's going to work and not doing anything in those 15 minutes, that never worked for me. <laughs> but, but what does work is, is getting busy and trying to do something. Trying to, even if it's just going to, okay, I'm going to go do a load of laundry or something like that. Just doing something that where you're not thinking and obsessing over the alcohol. That's what tends to work best for me. One of the things that really helps me, and we'll actually, in our members area that we're making at TalkSober.com, um, I'll actually have all the audios of our videos and our live shows actually put in an MP3. Because for me, on my phone, um, I have somewhere in here these pants have huge pockets uh somewhere in my phone i have this this program it's just a little mp3 player you could use an mp3 you could use your phone and what i do is i listen to different talks every night right so last night i was listening to this lady um and then i just have tons and tons of them and i listen to them and they help and and when i first got sober i knew i was going to go to anxious things so in the car i would listen to them and it would just calm me down uh, sound of the voice, sound of the stuff. Um, and if these help you, if these talks help you, uh, check out the members area because we're going to have the MP3s. You can put them into your phone, listen to them whenever you want. We'll title them for you. Um, maybe even title it like, hey, when you're pissed off, listen to this one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which is, you know, it's good because it, it really gives you perspective, you know, and that's really what we need is perspective to understand, one, what's going on with us, and two, life's not as bad as we think it is it's actually pretty good uh, i know some people are in bad circumstances and things like that but all in all you're going to be okay life goes on you're going to be able to uh, do something right um, and you're alive so that's a plus so you know you got to look at right and, and, and it's difficult if you're if you're still in that alcoholic uh, circle there and you're having trouble quitting and it may not seem like life is life is uh, can get better, but you know it, it's amazing for me. It was just a matter of um, doing the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life, which was quitting drinking. But once I quit drinking, it blew me away, and I, there was no way I would have believed it. But the rest of my life started to come together, and I mean, I guess for many people that's a given, but uh, maybe not. Maybe uh, those. Some of the situations are just, they seem insurmountable, but uh, most situations really are surmountable and getting rid of the alcohol is the quickest way to take care of a lot of these things. And the other things will just tend to fall, start to fall into place. You'll learn to, you'll start to learn what, what action to take next. And uh, it's not a super fast process, but, it, but it's a process that works. And alcohol, for me at least, was the uh, the common denominator in all of my problems. I never yeah. thought it was. It's interesting, too, because we look at that, and I remember I wanted to get sober so that I could kick ass in work and get rich. Like, that, that was my, I'm like, okay, I'm an idiot at work, and um, if I quit drinking, I'd be, I'd be better, and I'd be able to make a bunch. And, um, and so I looked at that, and when I got sober, I actually lost a lot of that, Right. Like I, my business was down to bare minimum. It made us enough to live on, but just about enough to live on. Um, and so and I was living in a rented place, which was a total blow to my ego because um, we came from a place we owned, which I loved. And we moved into this. Uh, they actually moved me into it while I was at rehab. I didn't even know where I was going, uh, my kids <laughs> and everything. And, um, you know, I remember that. And I remember actually feeling happier and feeling more content being sober in the environment that I used to just dread and just learning to live okay, learning to say I'm okay. Because a lot of times we look at things and we're like, I want my life to be this way or I hate that my life was this way, right? And we're looking at future or past, which is living in fear. 
instead of looking at right now and learning to be content right now. And as right. long as you're safe, fed, you know, you're okay right now. You're okay right now. And you can always grow from that point. But I think what you'll learn also is you don't really need what you thought you needed all along. And you don't really want what you thought you wanted all along. And what you want is to be able to be content, be able to go out and sit on the porch and just be okay without those thoughts yeah. racing, without thinking about, oh my God, I got to do this, I got to do that. Those things will come in. Sure, I'm way behind on work, believe me. But I can actually go to sleep and turn off the office without saying, I need to work all night to get this done, right? Because I realize, right, right? I realize one important thing. When I'm not in my head, I have all the time in the world right now. Think about right. that for a minute. Right now, you have all the time in the world. In this space, you have all the time in the world to do what you need to do, right? And if you really focus, but the problem is, is we focus on what I'm going to do, what I did, what he said, what I'm going to say. Where I, we focus on all this stuff rather than living now and saying, right now, I'm actually okay without a drink. Right now, I'm actually okay just, just being, just chilling out with you guys here on the YouTube. I'm good. Hanging out with Terry, I'm good. I don't need anything, right? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Being in the now, mm -hmm. that's an important thing. And, and I hate it because it's a cliche, but, you know, it's good. No, no. It's, that's, <laughs> a, hey, what, you know, and sobriety has a lot of cliches, and, uh, and uh, they're all true, or at least most of them are true. <laughs> most yeah. of them relate to me, but, uh, yeah. Hey, Naomi, yeah, that, I just wanted to point out that one comment you have there. I can't just have one. I know that now one will lead to 14 and then to 28 all over again, and I've seen that happen so many times. Um, for me, when after I had quit for a little while, right after he rehab, I had that one. And for me, it took me one day, and I was back to a half gallon of, of hard liquor immediately. For some people, they, uh, they'll have that one, and they do all right. They're fine. And they can, they'll have another one, you know, a few days later, and then that's, that's what it can get even more dangerous to where they start to think that they're okay. And then a month down the road, they're back in that same place they were before. It's a dangerous thing. It's a good point you made there, Naomi. It's uh, you can't just have one. That one is the worst one. I think it's interesting too because I don't know if you notice this in your sobriety, uh, but for me, I notice that I have a lot of whatever I have. So, like, if I go get a bag of Skittles, I don't just have one. I have to have like twenty. If I have waters, like when I get these little seltzer waters. I like buy the store out of seltzer waters because, you know, I have, I probably have a box and a half a day easily. Um, and so it's interesting because alcohol adds the extra layer of one, you're getting drunk and two, it's manipulating your mind, but also yeah. realize yourself as a pattern. Sometimes you just have a lot of whatever you have. For me, um, I know me and my aunt joke all the time because she, my aunt's the kind of person who she stops at drive throughs just to get a drink. Cause she's like a big drink of tea or uh, I know she likes sweet tea, which is a little too syrupy <laughs> for me. I like Coke, which is worse, but you know, um, yeah, you, you always got to have something. So that's kind of interesting too, is realizing, you know, Hey, my body likes to drink something. It doesn't have to be alcohol. It could be something right. else. Um, Let me tell you a story about addiction and more mm -hmm. because I went and visited my uh, parents. Uh, they live out of state. And this was uh, last week. So um, my, my father is to the point where he can't form sentences anymore. He's, he's in the later stages of his life. Um, he can repeat words that I say, and he can say hello, and that's about it. He's starting to become kind of unaware. He's been sober for 32 years, although I would guarantee that he doesn't know that he's an alcoholic anymore. Um, that's probably about where his brain is. So with that said, um, what I do every day when I go to visit them, um, when I'm up there, is I, uh, I get them a big cup of coffee, and I get myself a cup of coffee, and, and I give it to them. And it, it just dawned on me how addiction is it's a disease of more, because this is just coffee, not alcohol. I give it to them. It doesn't matter if it's too hot for him to drink or too cold or whatever. 
he pounds that sucker so fast. I mean, it's like a, a guy guzzling a beer. He drinks it that quickly, and then he grabs my coffee and drinks that one too. He's he's got that disease still of more, and that it just it blew me away because he, that is the reptile brain right there. Mm-hmm. Is he's got that reptile brain, and it's just it's just automatic. Doesn't even think about it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's totally, I mean, he can't, like, his brain's not functioning like it used to, but that reptile still kicked in, which is, yep. I mean, that's a pretty big testament to how the reptile works and, and, and what's going on, and that it doesn't matter who you are, how you feel, what you think, what your status is. Um, we all have the same reptile. Like, Bill Gates has a reptile brain. You know, your favorite actor has the reptile brain. I got the reptile brain. My dog's got the reptile brain. Uh, trying to help her get the brain of, you know, go to the bathroom on the grass, not the concrete by the pool. But we're working on it, right? <laughs> Although she does own the pool now. She owns it. Like, if we're not out there, she's just in there swimming laps. She loves it. Um, but, you know, the reptile brain's interesting because you look at that with the dog. Like, a dog could totally love you. And I talk about this um, with people who own pit bulls. And pit bulls are great dogs, uh, yeah, yeah. but they have a tweak in their brain, and I wouldn't raise my three-year-old with a pit bull. Nothing against the dog. They just have a brain that's like, we're going to go get something. Um, can they be trained? Probably. Totally. You know, I mean, anything can. But I remember uh, years ago, we were at the park, and my kids were little bitty, little bitty kids. And this guy had a huge beer. And two pit bulls not on a leash. And he's like, they're the friendliest dogs in the world. And they were. We were loving on these dogs. They were going up to the kids. And, I mean, these were like little fluffy dogs. You would never think, hey, you know, there's a pit bull. Not that there's anything wrong with them. I love pit bulls. And they should be rescued and not bad. Um, But as they were playing, nicest dogs in the world, a little girl squealed. You know, that high-pitched squeal that little girls do. And it was clear across the park. We were over here, and you just watched the dog's face change. And it, 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 I mean, it was almost like, huh. like a spiritual, mental change in this dog. Like, boom, I'm ready. And I watched it, and I, was like, I told my wife, I was like, hey, we better watch out for this. Not that I think there's anything wrong with the dog, but there's that tweak in the brain. There's that tweak of, I'm going to go get something. Um, and I'm sure every dog, every human, we all have that. It's the same thing that gets you out of the car with road rage. It's like, you're not an asshole. This situation has taught you to, has triggered something in your brain that says, hey, flight or fight. Um, and it's interesting like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. Um, yeah, for, for road rage, it's, for, for me, you know, I, I got in a situation once, and uh, it, and I'm not going to describe the situation, but it was a road rage thing, and it was very embarrassing. And um, I was able to tell myself, okay, never again. I am going to smile and wave. That will be my tool from now on, and mouth the word sorry. And that's what I'm going to do from now on, no matter what, whether it's his fault or my fault. I'll use the horn to, you know, warn people if they're going to hit me or whatever, but that's it. And uh, I did that. And wow, driving is so much easier now because another thing I do is another tool is I tell myself, this person, I'm pretty sure, didn't wake up this morning and, and say, I'm going to go cut Terry off today when he's driving. You know, that's probably not what they were doing. So yeah. it's tools like that. And same, same with drinking. Um, if, I, if I was to have a craving, I would... Find something else to do, or or I'd go and have like a maybe a Gatorade. I know they're not so healthy, or a Coke, you know, something like that. But I definitely find uh, something to substitute with. It's it's very useful to have tools, and it's good to know what these tools are. Like when I go out to uh, if I'm going out to eat, and everybody I'm that it's a table of ten of all my friends, and they're all having wine. Well. I, uh, I, I'm going there with an idea on what I'm going to order to drink. I'm not going to just look at the wine and try and figure, oh, my God, I just have to have water. I don't like plain water. So I'm going to figure out something, club soda with a splash of grapefruit juice or whatever, something like that. Mm-hmm. So having a plan is going to help, help you make that pause and keep that reptile brain under control. Mm-hmm. And if you want to feel like you're having a drink, get a tonic water. 
because they'll charge you like a drink, but it's not a drink. <laughs> um, and they're actually pretty good. I, I buy yeah. uh, tonic waters here. Uh, what I do is I mix it with water because it's a little bit much on its own. So I'll just right. mix it with water and then, you know, it goes a long way. But uh, those are good. And um, I realized uh, early on soda was good sometimes. Like if I'm kind of bent out of shape, I get that low blood sugar, I'll have that. Um, you know, in moderation, don't have a million and get a big old belly like me sometimes. Um, and I also noticed Diet Coke makes me irritated. It's the weirdest thing. Like I'll have Diet Coke and it just, it does something to me and it makes me irritated and just angry. Um, so you well, just, there's a lot of weird that. chemicals in, in the diet sodas. So yeah, okay, yeah. I could see that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm angry because I'm chemicaling myself or something. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Um, but yeah, you know, you got to look at that and, and just understand that, hey, the reptile brain's at work and it works when you don't. Right. It's working all the time. It's working right now. Right. You're sitting here coming up with plans to get sober. It's sitting there thinking of how to go get you drunk. Yeah. You know, so you got to really pay attention to that. I, I was talking to a friend of mine that's been sober for uh, about 15 years now and, um, they were having a party um, for, uh, I think it was birthday party for her husband or something. And he's, he's normal. He can drink normally. And um, so there was alcohol at the party. And um, she found herself, without even thinking, now this is 15 years sober. And she found herself grabbing a beer. And she put it up to her lips. And she stopped. But that was the reptile brain. Just She, she has no idea why she did that. Mm -hmm. um, she does everything she can for her sobriety, but sometimes it's it's something that you just don't even see until the last second, or maybe I, yeah, I don't know. It was it was just a very scary story to me. I'm like, I haven't had that happen to myself, but what hanging out with other sober people allow me to see these things and understand that this disease is always still there. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's a weird one. It's just a uh... It's an interesting one because a lot of people try to psychoanalyze and figure it out, which is cool. I mean, that's good. I like psychoanalyzing as much as the next person, probably a little more. <laughs> um, but uh, realizing the basics is what's going to keep you sober. Right. Like psychoanalyzing if your mom is the reason you drink or whatever. The reason you drink is because you're an alcoholic. I mean, sure, your mom might have been this. Your dad might have been that. You might have had your shoes too tight or whatever. But that doesn't matter. What matters is yep. the result. Like, what That's result do I want? And I found out getting sober, I mean, I had a lot of stuff. If you guys watched my other videos, I had a lot of stuff to deal with. And when I got sober, it was interesting because I didn't really care as much about the stuff. And it was in perspective. Right? It was like, okay, now I have issues with my, my mom or my dad or whatever. But it doesn't, it doesn't have to bug me 24-7. It doesn't have to... Like, I can, I can talk to her, and I can love her, and I can just be like, and. Right before it was like, well, I love my mom, but all this shit. Now I'm like, well, I love my mom and all this shit. That's cool. She can have the shit. I'll have the love. Yay. You know? Um, and it just kind of gets there. Uh, you want to take Bradley's comment there? Well, wow, that's scary, having four days sober and... A home detox um, yeah it's definitely not for everyone and I have to say right now that if you do have an alcohol problem you really do need to go see a doctor it's a it's a dangerous disease and hopefully uh, Bradley you're through the detox because uh, detox can kill it almost killed me um, but uh, yeah congratulations on four days though man you know four days is huge that is just the biggest thing um, and uh, keep on working on it. And, you know, you coming on this video, that's that's one thing. You, for me, when I was four days sober, I decided I was just going to do every single solitary thing I had to do to stay sober. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, after I had gotten through that detox, the detox was the worst thing. But good job. Yep. And he, he says there, too, um, it took him three months for to get it through his hazy, alcohol-filled brain that it was causing the anxiety. Oh, and yeah. that's, that's something important because it's like the alcohol is causing a lot of the problems that you know, now have, right? Because a lot of people think, well, if I could solve my anxiety, I wouldn't drink as much. If I didn't have um, 
all this stuff from my past, I wouldn't drink as much. If I could solve everything else, I'd drink like a normal person. Wrong. You're drinking not like a normal person because it's causing all this stuff, right? So this is the source of your issues is the drinking. Now, of course, there's other issues. There's other stuff going on. But once you take the alcohol out of the picture, you're able to think clearly and say, well, you know, anxiety is probably not going to kill me. Alcohol will eventually if I have enough of it. Um, so we got to look at that and we got to understand, hey, look, this is, this is a big deal. You know, it's like, it's like if you were hitting yourself in the head or something and you're like, man, you know, I got a headache. Well, I better keep hitting myself because, you know, that takes it away for a minute because then this hurts instead of my mind. And you're just like, you're not realizing that that's what's causing it. Um, and you're kind of in a self-induced psychosis, if you want to say big words that I don't understand. Um, you know, it's a self-induced type of way of thinking and you're manipulating your thoughts and you can't think straight. So if you try right. to think straight with manipulated thoughts, you're just going to go around in a circle. You got to deal with the problem, which is the drinking and the alcohol mind. Um, and for Bradley, you know, it's going to take a while for your brain to get back to normal, um, you know, and, and just ride it out. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the process of being sober. Enjoy the process of every single day saying, hey, I don't have to drink today. Um, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, Brad, Bradley, I was, uh, I was very similar as far as the anxiety. Um, I, didn't, I did not go through life with a ton of anxiety. I, I would say I had normal amounts of anxiety as far as what, uh, whatever, whatever normal is, but uh, I think everybody has some sort of anxiety. But, um, you know, as the drinking kept escalating and I realized more and more out of that alcoholic fog that I had to quit, that anxiety just kept on going higher and higher. And it was that, that, uh, that circle, as Marcus just mentioned, that, that never-ending merry-go-round of, I need to quit, but maybe I'll just have one more. Oh, now I'll have the, oh, crap, I finished the whole bottle. Dang it. And go to pass out, wake up the next day. You know, it's that merry-go-round of drinking. Just continuing on. We're realizing that I got to quit. It's killing me. And I just didn't have a way out. And that was what was the most frustrating thing. And that just increased that anxiety until I was finally able to get some help and get sober and uh, work on it now. So, yeah, it's good. Cool. You want to take Chad? So 26 went through tremors and anxiety, but that's about as rough as it got from half a bottle of whiskey a day to one beer a day. Still trying. Good luck to you all. That's a tough one, uh, Chad. Um, good job getting through it. That's, uh, that's good that you uh, didn't have too bad a detox uh, from half a bottle of whiskey. It, and, you know, it doesn't really matter how much um, a person drinks. That's, that's what I've learned. I, I had a guy... Uh, uh, that's been sober many decades, and he was he was telling me that he drank a I drank a bottle of wine a night, and I'm like a bottle of wine. That's that was like my chaser. What I drank to get rid of the shakes. That's nothing. Yeah. But you know what it was is that bottle of wine was it, it was making his life just terrible. It was making his life unmanageable, and that's what it is. It, it's the amount of if if. If any amount of alcohol is making your life unmanageable or you're getting these negative consequences despite what you're trying to do, then it's maybe alcoholism is a problem or alcohol is a problem and you might need to look at quitting. Um, yeah, it's that's a tough one. Yeah, uh, and, Naomi and just said, she well, you had the delirium tremens and it was hell. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it was. It, I see you scared you into the into the sobriety and um yeah i don't know if it's i guess it scared me into sobriety um i have no idea because i know a person that's gone through exactly the same thing as myself and what it sounds like naomi did and uh this person keeps on drinking and they keep on going to the icu some people it's just not enough well and i think um i think a lot of it is just what you do like, forget about all the, you know, it's like in religion, you know, it's like make a decision to change your life right now. Um, you know, that's, 
it could be what it's about, but this isn't about willpower. Like, if it's about right. the ICU scaring you, then it's about your willpower. If it's about Terry uh, having his issues, then it's about his willpower. But I know for a fact, for me, and I'm pretty sure with Terry, it's not a willpower thing. I didn't will myself into sobriety. Nope. I got, I, I was suicidal. I was stuck in rehab. And I thank God I was stuck in the rehab because of that. And I was in a mental hospital for uh, four hours, supposed to be for 72, but I was so scared, I talked my way out. But was that moment fear of, oh, my God, I don't want to be in a mental hospital? Well, probably. I was scared to death. There was a lady that looks like she's going to poke me in the eye and a lady talking to grass. Um, But that wasn't it. What was it was the daily changes and the realization that my mind has been warped. Like, I remember thinking to myself, I got into the mental hospital and I was like, one flew over to Cuckoo's Nest. That's what I thought, right? I'm like, where's Cheswick? Where is he? You know, where's this guy? Um, And I remember I thought, I don't belong here. That was my reptile saying, I don't belong here. I belong at the bar. But my brain said, this is exactly where you belong because you're insane because you drank. And it's exactly where it is. And I started to understand that, hey, you know what? doesn't matter the willpower we muster. It doesn't matter how we get sober. Rock bottom, who knows what that even means, right? Right. And, and we look at it and we're like, well, what's the fact of the matter? The fact of the matter is, is I don't want to live this way anymore. And like with Terry's friend who keeps going to the ICU, is it because he just wants to keep drinking? Or is it because he hasn't found a better way and done it long enough? Right? Because I guarantee if you gave him a better way and you're like, hey, buddy, we're just going to we're going to do this together um, and not that it's on my willpower. It's not on me to get him sober. But if he did something enough, I believe that his mind would would wake up to say, hey, there is a better way. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. And that's that, that's a lot of times what um, I, tr- I try to tell people when they when they keep going out and start drinking again and they keep coming back is, well, not tell them, but I ask them, well, well, what are you doing differently this time than you were before? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, some people will, they'll, they'll do something like, uh, okay, they got sober and they're going to go to AA meetings and that's the only thing they're going to do is go to AA meetings and then they start drinking again and wonder why. Yeah. And they didn't change anything else in their life. All they're going is going and sitting in a room for an hour and listening to people and sure that helps and it gives them education, but are they really doing more stuff you can't just do the one thing you have to do as much as you possibly can and like marcus listens to tapes and then he has these videos that and then he makes videos and he does does things for his sobriety and i do things as well it's uh it, it, it's you have to do whatever it takes and that's what i usually find is that these people that the people that continue to go out is they haven't changed a lot in their life. They still are going back to that apartment or like what I did is I sat in my house and watched Dr. Phil. I watched him cure people with alcoholism. And, uh, that, and But I kept drinking because I kept yeah. doing the same thing. And that's what I did when I got out of rehab is I turned on Dr. Phil and I didn't have the bottle. And then eventually I did have the bottle because I didn't change anything. Yeah. It's interesting too because uh, one thing someone noticed was about the amounts, right? The amounts of drinking. And I remember thinking as you guys were talking about the amounts of drinking, that that is evidence that nothing has changed, right? To me, I look at that and I go in and I talk to people who are other alcoholics and it's like, well, this is how much I drank. And it's like, well, you little penny waste. I used to drink five gallons straight out of the pool. My pool was filled with alcohol. And it's that reptile brain of, I got to be better. I got to have one up. I got to listen to what you're doing. And it's getting caught in the humdrum of society, of life, of status, of I'm better, I'm bigger, mine's worse, my struggle was worse. When in reality, one of the things sobriety has taught me is that I'm no different than all the other 8 billion people on this planet or 7.5 billion or whatever. There's no (laughs) difference, right? There's no difference in the value of my life versus the value of a life of a kid in India who just spends all day picking through metal to get enough scraps to get something to eat. There's no, there's no difference in value, right? Our society tends to say, well, you know, Marcus is worth uh, this much a year and, you know, Michael Jordan's worth a million dollars a minute and this. 
And it's like, to what end? Right, this guy drank a lot. This guy didn't. This guy's got the worst. He's got 50 years sobriety. You know, to what end? And we have to look at life and say, to what end? Is this, is this enjoying? Is this enjoying my life? Is this going through? Am I being the best possible version of myself possible? Probably not. I can always do better. Um, but don't get caught in the traps. The traps are out there, right? And don't listen to everyone in sobriety. Get what you can. Don't be picky about where you get your truth. Some total, like, mean dude will come up with one sentence, and you'll be like, I like that. And he'll probably go, get at, go out and get drunk because he's a mean dude or whatever. Or maybe not. Who knows? Who cares? This is your sobriety. Deal with it your way. But take those little things and take the nuggets. Some of the stuff I'll say, you'll be like, Marcus is off his rocker. And it does rock. See? Just a little bit. I'm not off it yet. Um, and some stuff you'll be like, wow, that's going to help me. And some stuff right. you'll say to yourself and it'll work. And, and you know, you really got to look at that. Um, so, yeah, let's take a couple others here. We got... Let me take Chad's right there. I like that Go one. I remember before alcohol, I had an, an adrenaline-rich lifestyle. I mountain biked, cliff diving, and I and I stopped so I could. So I took the closest, to easiest thing to feel something that was alcohol. And you know, for me, um, I'm I'm a cyclist. I was a cyclist before uh, drinking became a problem. Um, I mountain biked and road biked and ski and. I never cliff dived. <laughs> sounds like a, this, that definitely sounds like an adrenaline rush. But uh, um, I've done the high dives up at hitting up that at San Seattle, Francisco water where Lake you're Washington, at. I, I but, don't know uh, if I'd want to do that. <laughs> but you know, I I would. Uh, um, I didn't stop those things and start drinking. Alcohol just kind of invaded those things. I actually did a a, a century ride, and I started this ride off, and I was going through detox because I was going to ride it sober, but I trained drinking. And um, I told my friends I was with that I had to, that uh, I, there was something wrong with my bike, and I went back to my truck and filled one of my water bottles full of vodka, and then I did the ride. That's the insanity of this disease. And uh, But eventually, I just stopped doing all those extracurricular activities, the biking and the skiing and all that stuff, and I just lived in the bottle. And I mean, what a horrible life. I mean, it hurt me physically and mentally, and you know, all the way around. But um, now that I'm sober, I'm back to doing those things. I'm a bit older now, so I don't know if cliff diving would be. I could probably still. <laughs> no, I don't think so. But um, I still cycle and mountain mountain bike and ski and do all those things, and it's awesome doing them sober. I didn't think I could ski without beers at lunch, but you know, it's really not a problem. <laughs> so. You actually go straight now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's interesting. Maybe you could do rock diving. Find a little, like, five-foot rock. There you go. Really um, but, yeah, you know, it's interesting because, like um, Jason says, it's fake truths about alcohol. You're more successful, sexy, funnier. Society glamorizes it very much, and it makes a lot of money. And that, that's very true, you know? Yeah. I used to think that I wasn't funny without alcohol. But, actually, I think it's – I think people were laughing at me, you know? Um, right. So you just got to look at that, and and you know it's it's a myth. It's like I'm better looking with alcohol. I don't think so. I take le less baths when I did alcohol, you know, <laughs> so I doubt it. Um, and I was overweight quite a bit more than I am now. Um, and I, I just wasn't mentally. I wasn't mentally happy. You know? I get I get this one. Uh, this one Facebook thing, um, you know how you get the five years ago today, and then one of them came up the the other day, and it was a, some friends of ours, and we went and s went to see uh, Roger Waters from Pink Floyd, and the three of us are there, and there somebody took our pictures, and my face was so round, and I, I was just reading Bradley's one, and, um, his comment on it's amazing how many people notice that they look better. Well, yeah, look at those old pictures. And uh, when I went into rehab, they took a before picture when I went into rehab. There's one to look at. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how uh, how much healthier you, you tend to get. Alcohol, I, uh, you know, you get all you get all puffy. And, and when uh, I, uh, then you stop exercising, so of course you gain weight. And, um, I had high blood pressure. I was pre-diabetic. And um, I don't take any medicines for any of that 
anymore. And it, it's to, you know, it's from stopping drinking. It's what it was. It's amazing what, what that can do. And I remember, um, I think we met up a year after alcohol, about a year. And uh, I didn't recognize Terry. I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, here's this, you know, good looking, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. dude. <laughs> and, but I mean, from what I remember in rehab, I was like, this isn't the same guy. You know, he's like all put together and, you know, uh, you had lost a lot of weight. I remember that. Yeah. Um, and you just, you glowed. You were happy. You were like comfortable in your own skin. I know that's a big thing um, right. a lot of alcoholics talk about is like, I'm totally comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. You know, yeah. before it was not like that. I, I hated myself. And now I'm like, you know, to each his own. And I don't think I'm perfect or nothing. I'm like, whatever, you know. Probably a two on the scale of one to ten, but hey, um, you know, you just you just look at it and you're content and you're happy and you're, right, right. you know. So you know when when I was in the midst of the alcohol, my entire goal was to um, I had all these material goals, you know, get rich, get the car, get the motorcycle, get the best bike, all this stuff, and uh, you know it, it's. It's amazing because now that I'm sober, it's not that. I don't want the, yeah, I want a home. I want a car that works and I, you know, I want a decent car, but, you know, but, uh, but really for me, it's being happy. And that's, that's what I strive for. And that's what I try to do every day is just try to do things that make me happy. And it's, it's amazing. The things that make me happy now are things like, um, Doing videos like this, helping other people. Yep. It's, I never thought I'd want to help other people. <laughs> but it's what sobriety uh, tends to get me uh, in that direction. Yeah. It's interesting, too, because I notice now when I get the things that I used to think I wanted. Like when I used to get something uh, before I got sober, I was like, man, I'm badass. Look at what I bought. This is cool. Now it's kind of like, oh, that's cool. We got that now. You know? we didn't have it we wouldn't have it but it's cool you know a you know better gas mileage or whatever um like where we live whatever it's it's kind of like a it's like a bonus rather than the goal if that makes sense it's like hey cool instead of i gotta have that or i'm now good because i have this or i'm now successful because i have this i'm successful because i don't drink today right That's why i'm successful of right? Is that my own power? I don't know. Probably not. Um, you know, and we look at it and we're like, hey, you know what? I just got to do what I got to do to stay sober and look at life not like everyone else looks at life. And just look at it as, hey, we're cool. We can go through. We can help people, hopefully. Hopefully it helps people. If it doesn't, it at least helps me and Terry get to hang out for an hour a week or whatever. Um, you know, and we just we look at life different. And that, I think, is the takeaway, because you've been looking at life through the reptile brain. Yep. You've been looking at it saying, hey, I got to drink, I got to get, I got to do, I got to be, I got to have, I got to want, I got to desire. And it's like, what's, who's this I? Who's the I that wants it? Right. Do you ever think about that? Because I really didn't want it. And now I don't even know who an I is, and I don't really care that I don't know that. Before I had to care, I had to be like, who is Marcus? Is Marcus this? Is Marcus that? Who cares? I'm just me, right? And I think half the time, the problem that we have is we have way too much time to sit around and think about these things. Right? We're just sitting around thinking about them instead of actually doing something else. Um, and when my kids come to me, and, you know, we have teenagers, and teenagers are perpetually bored. I don't know what it is. It's like, what are you bored about? You know, <laughs> go do something. Um, and we look at it and every time I'm like, Hey, if you're bored, let's go feed some homeless people. Let's go get you out of your head. Focus on someone else. Focus on something else. Focus right. on something you can do. And I remember when I was an alcoholic, I couldn't do this because I had to save the world. Like in my alcoholic brain, I was the most brilliant person. No one understood me because I was so smart and I could solve all the world's problems. Like I knew all the answers to politics even though now sober, I'm completely against what I thought was so brilliant back then. Um, <laughs> but I didn't do anything because I thought 
I was so great. Right. And now I'm like, you know what? I go and I help people. I'm like, I'm just like the homeless guy. He just had a circumstance that brought him down something, some path that I could easily go down. Right. And I realized that at any minute, anything could change me. Anything can. Right. And I learned to live with the fact that I'm vulnerable. I'm vulnerable to things. I'm vulnerable to a damn beer. You know, that's not a beer, by the way. It is just a prop, for example. That's my apple water. Um, <laughs> but I'm vulnerable to a beer. And that's why I don't drink today, because I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't want to figure it out. Right. Could I maybe perhaps have one and just call it a day? Why? Why the hell would I even question that? Right. Why? Why? Why bother? Right. Why listen to the reptile? Um, and we got to look at it that way because we don't know. Uh, M says we both look good and healthy. Thank you. What alcohol does to your looks also mirrors the inside. Like I like your show. Well, thanks, M. Uh, make sure you subscribe. Check out TalkSober.com. Um, we're going to put the letters that we've been reading over the last couple videos on TalkSober.com. Uh, we're also starting a membership area where I think it'll help you get and stay sober. I, I also think it'll help you with life issues. Um, I'm going on 40. Um, so, I mean, a lot of other people have a lot more life experience. But I've been through a lot in my life. And a lot of people tell me that I have a different perspective on it. Um, and that's kind of what we hope to put in there is my perspective, Terry's perspective, and just help you guys get where you want to go. Uh, you want to take Jason's? Uh, I, you, I think being sober is giving you universal truth and awareness. When I was drunk, I was delusional and trying to live to society's programmed ideas. I'm happy now, not trying to compete now. Um, you know, I don't know that so... Being sober has given me universal truth and awareness. Well, it, it has given me a certain amount of awareness, but what it has um, allowed me to do is to not react as much and try to be more open-minded to, to what, people, what people's opinions, even if they're not mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's opened me up to their opinions. It's opened me up to... Um, to to trying to find the truth, maybe not being given the truth, but just just trying to trying to find the the right answer and understanding that I don't have the right answer. A lot of the time, a lot of the times I have the wrong answer and be open minded to change. Yeah. That's a that's a that's a big thing for me. Um, definitely, when I was drunk, I was delusional as well, and and. Uh, yeah, I, I was playing, I, you say uh, you were trying to live to society's programmed ideas. And I was definitely much the same way. I was like the, the actor. I was trying to act the way I thought people wanted to see me and uh, trying to show that everything was great, even though my life was completely falling apart on the inside. And uh, definitely, I, I don't try to compete with other people. Well, you know, I do. I It's, it's something that I that I have to work on every day. I do compare myself to others. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that I have to try to let go of. But uh, you know, now that I'm sober, at least uh, I'm aware of that and I can try to just be my own person. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one, you know, because society does good, but it's not perfect. Like everyone who has this idea of what should be done, it's never going to be perfect because people aren't perfect. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. No one guy has the answers. Um, and we just, we have to be okay. And I, I look at it as like living in the space, right? Because we look at it and everything we do is about the topic. You read a book, you listen to words, you listen to us talk, and you're listening to the words. But there's also a lot said in the space, the space between the words. And that's where we live life is the space between the stuff. The space between the job, the space between the work, the space between the argument with the spouse. We're living in the space between. And if we learn to just pause and be there in that space. And like when I used to drink, my spouse and I would get in an argument. And I'd be like, okay, I need to decide whether to divorce or stay right now. You know, and now here I am three years, four years later. And we still have arguments. And sometimes I still think, oh, well, maybe I should leave. Maybe I should stay. Um, but I don't have to do anything right now. Right. 
I can live in the space. And I can look at it and say, well, we have a disagreement. She has a different way of looking at things than I do. And that's okay. That's all right. You know, maybe sometimes I'll try to help with, hey, you know, I think that this might help. Um, but again, I have to be like, I'm not some enlightened, wonderful know-it-all. I don't know. Right? And, and that was part of my hang-up was I used to think that I had to know and I had to fix everything. And people would come to me and they're like, oh, you're so good at stuff. And I'm like, yeah, if you only knew, I can fix everyone but me. Um, you know, and we really have to look at it and be like, let's live in the space. Let's be right. in the space. The space is where it's all at. Um, you know, because we're looking and, and as humans, we're trained to look at things. It's like when you're a kid, birthday, Christmas, this, and you're living your life waiting for these moments rather than living your life. And what sobriety has shown me is how I live my life. How do I enjoy the day-to-day -day mundane things? How do I enjoy a day where I don't feel good? How do I enjoy a day where things seem to be crashing down? Um, and I remember a couple months ago, we had an issue with our business. And uh, I had never had someone show up at my door about my business. <laughs> and uh, that happened. And he was sitting there. And it was for some IRS stuff from uh, back when I didn't get sober. And I was like... I, I, I talked to him. I was like, dude, if the IRS had come to my house four years ago, I would have been drinking whatever I had while he was here, and I would have been flipping out. And I told him, I'm like, I don't know what it is. I'm totally chill. And it actually turns out, you know, uh, his spouse had an issue too, and she's trying to deal with it, and we got into talking about it. I'm like, wow, this totally did not go how I planned it to go. Life's not over. It's not the end of the world. I just have an issue I need to clear up. Here we go. Let's clear it up. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, it baffled me. I was like, why the hell am I so calm? What's wrong? You know, <laughs> what am I not on? <laughs> you know, um, and it's interesting. Uh, right. Jason says, uh, or M says, these shows help us with alcoholic partners or who had sometimes enough is enough. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, Jason says, I think like what you are saying, patience is a hard thing to achieve. One of the reasons you want to drink is instant gratification. Exactly. Trying to instant, instant, instant. All right. You want to take some others, and then we'll call it a wrap in a couple minutes? Um, sure. Well, there's just one more. <laughs> the first time I saw a Marcus video, I was waiting at the end where he was going, inviting me to his island and walk, <laughs> and walk on the coals, but not the case. These are 100. Yeah, these are 100 percent honest and helpful. <laughs> Sorry, I have to get so close to read things. I, I should be wearing my glasses. But uh, uh, yeah, I just try to speak up. But, but, you know what? What's I used to try to analyze people that I was trying to help that had alcohol problems, and I tried to tell people my opinions and all that. And uh, I realized that that was just absolutely the wrong thing to do. What I've learned is that what I try to do is tell people what my experience of what I've gone through. Um, has been, and uh, that seems to help people the most. My experience may be very different from other people's experience. Marcus's story and my story are very different as far as how we got to, uh, to sobriety, but the solution, even though this, the actual actions of our solution might be different, our solution is still the same. We still do the same things. We may just go about them a little bit differently. And honesty is one of them. That's when I got sober for the last time, uh, I told myself, I'm going to be honest from here on out because the lies and the uh, manipulations, they're just too much work to cover up all the time. So yeah. that's, my, uh, that's, that's the way I go about sobrieties. Willingness, sobriety, do whatever I have to do. Well, and the secret to life, is that there are no secrets. Right. There's right. no secrets. It just is what it is. And we learn and, and we focus. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what we want to leave you with. Um, now, over at TalkSober.com, we have uh, the notes. You can put your name and email to get the notes. Uh, we're also starting. I have to do more videos. So if you guys do have ideas of videos you want me to make just a step video on, um, not like a live stream, but a video on, go ahead and type those in the box. Put them as comments. Um, and I'll try to get to those. I definitely need to get back on the uh, video making kick. 
Um, but yeah, check out TalkSober.com. We do have a members area we're starting. Um, it's going to be 67 bucks a month if you guys think this will help you. Um, if you think it will help you and you don't have $67 a month, write us and we'll let you in. Um, if you do have 67 good. Go in there, get it, and it will help other people as well. Um, and we really just want to help you guys learn to live the way that helps us. You know, and I wouldn't trade my life now for anything. I'm completely happy. I'm content, you know, and that's where I'm at. And I think Terry's there too. Um, so, yeah, check that out, TalkSober.com. Definitely at least get the rest of the letters. We're also having the letters put into a book form uh, where you guys will be able to get the book. I think I'm going to do, like, a giveaway. If you guys pay the shipping, we'll send it out to you, uh, something like that. Um, so if you like that, let me know. Say, yeah, I like that idea. I'd like those letters in a book form, um, and I'll work on getting those done as well. So any uh, last-minute words of wisdom? Well, I think we covered a lot of stuff today, and uh, thank you, everybody, for making your comments. Uh, they're very helpful in, uh, in covering on how we can get sober. You know, everybody's opinion really matters to me, and um, that's, that's great. Thanks. All right, guys, thanks. Uh, it was fun hanging out with you. Stay sober, and we'll see you next time. All right, bye-bye. And go to TalkSober.com. <laughs>